So episode five of our Women's World Cup podcast. Laura, thank you so much for joining me. I'm very, very excited for what we're about to cover today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited too. So we always begin with a little bit of a background about you. So where, who are you? Where's your passion for entrepreneurship come from and your passion for sport as well? Just yeah. the, the quick rundown of everything, Laura. Good question. Um, I, I guess I describe myself as a bit of a Jill of all trades. I've mm-hmm. uh, had many lives, many careers, um, a quite a wide range of interests and things. And I, I think that all helps when you end up being an entrepreneur. Um, the, I mean, I started by studying physics, so I have quite a grounding in science worked for the British government for a while, worked for the Olympics in many places like Mozambique, Azerbaijan, Brazil, spent time in the Middle East in Abu Dhabi, um, accidentally worked for PwC for a bit um, and then (laughs) set up and run companies. So I think this mix of skills is very useful now because it means I can you see a problem and you're like, oh, I think I've come across this at some point, um, which is really fun. No, yeah, awesome. And then also, I'd love to touch on your passion for football. Where did that come from? Good Where question. And I, I have a brother and three guy cousins. And so growing up, it was either play football with the boys or just be, you'd be on your own um, <laughs> at the holidays. But I, I didn't really, I got scouted when I was 10, but it was one of those things that the setup in England wasn't really great at that point. And I went and played and it was like these pitches you know they're not great and it just wasn't a fun experience and at that time I was really into ballet so I was doing that and playing tennis and all sorts of things and it wasn't until I went to university that I was kind of rediscovered it and was like oh this is kind of fun and it's a good community and then I've used it as a way to make friends all around the world so um went to Brazil got to play played in London played everywhere really and um just I call myself a professional amateur because I just really love to play um and I get these beautiful opportunities to play with amazing players as a result Mm. of the stuff we've been doing with equal playing fields um and I'm always in awe when I get to play against kind of people that have played at the Olympics and at the World Cup I kind of pinch myself like oh this is fun um and kind of always striving to to be that little bit better but I've long ago got over the the kind of oh I can't play with these people because they're so good I just relish the opportunity it's amazing I would also love to talk a little bit and learn a little bit more about Ida Sports so the quick summary of how it began and what your mission is so it really came out of um, going to do the world record in Kilimanjaro and playing mm-hmm. playing football at the top um, and chatting to all these players. And I was just fed up of wearing kids' shoes. <laughs> and I thought there was this mythical land of women's shoes. And um, all the professional players, they've been to the Olympics, been to the World Cup, and they were wearing men's and kids as well. I was like, this is dumb. And aside from the fact it's kind of worse materials it's also like if you're wearing kids shoes it's also that they don't fit right but you don't really know mm. why they don't fit right and you just get a bit annoyed I kind of probably took that to its extreme conclusion of being like ah oh, let me find out the science and um learn all about women's and men's feet how we're completely different women are not small men research <laughs> went down a big research wormhole and then was like but the big brands talk about unisex like what is this like the science is saying one thing and like the brands are saying another like Mm. um and that's when I kind of realized there's this really great opportunity not only to change the system and change the industry but also to um kind of have an economic opportunity and build a great business out of it because no one was doing it and so that for me was kind of the impetus of like oh you got a win-win here like if we make this work this would be incredible Mm. We'll touch on Ida a little bit later and, and we'll go into a bit more of a deep dive into all things football boots and everything around that topic. But first, I'd actually like to start with some with a space that's quite popular and quite a hot topic at the moment that you've also talked a lot about, which is ACLs at the top level for women's players. So to give everyone a little bit of background on this, for those who might know, two dozen high-profile players were ruled out of this World Cup this year. We've already had a couple as well during the yeah. tournament and over 200 players at the elite level have teared their ACLs in the past two years. So it is a, it is a problem, I think. 
Um, and it's something that needs a lot more research on what it is. And so only now our governing bodies are sort of ta- starting to take it more seriously. FIFA have announced and FIFA Pro have announced they're going to be sort of doing more research and investigating how and why the causes are. Um, but we're also starting to move away from the original explanation, which was quite based on the physiolo- physiology of women saying that your hips are narrow or your feet are different or your knees are not as strong. Um, and we're sort of going to be looking a little bit more at social causes as well. Like I said, I know this is an area that you're really passionate about and you're researching. So I would love to start with, yeah, what you're seeing around why these tears are happening from, yeah, all corners of the globe. Yeah, I mean, it is it is pretty crazy. And I think it's something that it's starting to come to the forefront now as people, like obviously you have so many high profile players having done their ACL and being out of the tournament. I think my take on it and coming from this, and I knew nothing about it and really started to deep dive on it is that there's so many influencing factors. And if you think about it in the context of like, so there's very famous Team GB cycling, right? Um, mm. And before Beijing, and it was all about like, they did the 1%. So they were like, let's look at all the 1% and then let's try and improve our performance. And I think that's how we should approach the ACL um, thing. Because at the moment, there are so many different factors, but no one's really pulled out and worked out which is statistically significant and which ones really impact people the most. So the spaces where I think there's definitely more investigation needed is around, so hormones and menstrual cycle. Mm. And interestingly, um, Dr. Emma Rossi from the, the Well HQ talks about this in a really interesting way of like, is it because when you're on your period, you um, are more prone to it? So your ligaments, you've got relaxing and all of that going through and your ligaments are at least, or is it that you're more reckless when you're on your period so that you're Mm -hmm. more likely to engage in behavior that's like that? Yeah. Well, it's like, it's, I think I read it was Chelsea, isn't it? Chelsea women. They now do their training cycles based on, or they've using the menstrual cycle to sort of be the guide of how they're training so they're training differently at the different stages of the menstrual cycle to really just protect their players which I think is incredible and then you've got things like strength and conditioning and and there's FIFA 11 plus which is the great strength and conditioning stuff and and then you've also got load and uh, like a player's playing too many games and blah, blah, blah. Mm. I think one of the areas that I know a lot about and very interested in is that boot to surface connection and it's yeah. about okay, what are you wearing and what level of traction do you need? What level of traction do you actually need? And are you wearing something that the sponsors are just giving you? Or are you wearing the best shoe and the best thing for you for those particular conditions? Yeah. And then the other thing is, are you fitting that shoe to the pitch? So one of the, the big things we look at is the fact that players often train on one type of pitch, but maybe might play on another. And you're seeing that perhaps with the Emirates Stadium that you're, mm. the players... I mean, there was a lot done at the Emirates, right, this this, yeah. um, this year. So you're looking at, like, it's not necessarily the pitch itself per se. It's the how are you preparing your players to play on that pitch? Um, and are you provide like, are you choosing the the relevant products for you for, mm. for playing there? I think one of the things I love is, like, there's a brilliant photo of Harry Kane before the Champions League where he's trying on two different types of shoes and then picks the one that works for him. So it's that level is where I think the women's game should be, should be focusing as well. And yet no one's doing it. So I think for me, it's, it's something is we're not necessarily solvable, but you can definitely reduce the risk to players Mm. um, by very simple. Like, I mean, two pairs of shoes compared to one pair of shoes. Like for me, that's like a thing that you should be doing. Oh yeah. Um, So what, have you found sort of anything or are you still in the preliminary stages of just looking at it all? Is it sort of that's your next big task is to really Yeah, exactly. So we it. have a lot of like qualitative data. So um, feedback from players that have been wearing our shoes. And what we're doing now is adding that quant data. So really hard bats research. Um, but also, I mean, we, we're drawing some conclusions of like, especially talking to a lot of surgeons, you want to instead of sticking and twisting so for non-contact ACLs you want it like they'd prefer you to slip rather than to stick and twist because that's when yeah. if you're stuck in the turf then that's that's what's going to do it that's so great. we always recommend just kind of unless you're kind of in on these super wet pitches um go down attraction level um because 
again, you're reducing your risk. So as players, if you're an amateur player, for example, you don't need that like crazy level of traction um, because you're just playing kind of for fun and you want to keep your knees. (laughs) You want to keep them okay. (laughs) Um, So like I mentioned, we're sort of seeing research move more from the physiological, which is where it began, which is obviously the hips and the feet and the body and how it's different to a little bit more of the social and the inequitable causes of them. So like AstroTurf, playing on AstroTurf compared to the pitches, also statistically women's pitches are usually of a much lower quality than the men's, for example. Um, I think I saw Leah Williamson, who obviously is one of the biggest outs of this World Cup with her ACL, the captain of England, and she was talking about how for women who play, um, as a kid they play and then they're good enough and then they get thrust into effectively the WSL or a really intense elite level program whilst for men they get scouted when they're like six years old and they slowly build their way up so that their bodies are more prepared when it does come time that they play at the top level. Um, What are your thoughts on some of those and how are you sort of working to protect those players and raise awareness for the more social aspects of the ACL? Yeah, I guess it, that really comes down to the coaches as well. And if you've got a great coach and a great setup, then they'll be looking at the player and developing the player as they come through. I, I think one of the interesting case studies is around AFLW because that turned professional mm. six years ago. And at yep. the beginning, they, they had a lot more issues because you're moving from a kind of amateur sport to a professional sport, or semi-professional sport. And um, so players are... Again, in dealing with this increased load, what you're seeing now are players that would have started at 12 uh, or before, right, um, and are now professionally playing. So they've had, it, you'd hope that they the injury rate w- would decrease because they've had the opportunity to go all the way through and do the proper strength and conditioning and that kind of thing. Mm. However, I, I'm not actually a huge believer in the academy system, and I think there's a, an argument for not specializing too soon. So like Roger Federer only specialized in tennis at 14. And before that, he played loads of different sports. And I think, I mean, for Pete, what we're seeing, especially in the US, is that it becomes prohibitive because you have to be part of a travel team and you have to pay money and you have to be part of a club. Whereas actually... Mm. Part of the joy, I think, of playing and building all these different skills is being playing quite a few different sports. And then you go, oh, yeah, this is the one that, that I, I want to yeah. play a bit more. Um, and for, for better or worse, because I think it also if you're for every like 1% of player that makes it, you have all these players that were in the academy and, the, and football was their life and that was it. But then they're, they're not going to make it. Um, and I think it leaves you perhaps without a, as much of being a rounded human and, and you perhaps have to rebuild your your place so one of the things I do love about the women's game is you do have these players it's almost like they're still sort of having side careers so um I think they're just m- much more interesting um but but for the actual um physiology of the sport and the, the training it, it's about finding that balance I think between mm overloading but getting the skills but getting match practice and getting the experience to be on the world stage I was going to say you're talking about the academies and I think something as someone who was Australian I think that that I never realized that like that was such a thing over in the UK and and in and in football as well I remember reading somewhere that some player was scouted when they were six to to join Chelsea or something and I was like that is insane like that is Reese James that's incredible. Like it's, you're a six-year-old child. <laughs> you meet a six-year-old in real life and you think that they have begun and they have chosen to go on their pathway to an elite sport at six years old. It is wild for some, like for me to think that, yeah, you can be six and you're like, oh, yes, off we go and this is your path to be a professional. Yeah. Uh, and, someone and at six years old know what they want to do. <laughs> And perhaps that's the dedication that you need. As It was interesting for me connecting with um, obviously the professional athletes when we were doing the equal playing field stuff because mm. the dedication, they would climb the mountain and then do CrossFit afterwards. Um, and I was like, hell no. And, and and that was the moment I was like, I'm, I will never be a professional athlete. That is not me. Um, 
But for the business world, I have that same drive. So I will do my do my work and then I will procrastinate by I don't know, watching tooling videos of uh, outsole tooling and manufacturing or, or sitting in a spreadsheet and hanging out in zero, which I love, you know, the accounting tools. And, and, and that's yeah. when I realized like, okay, so I have that drive, but it's, it, it's focused in a different place for sure. Okay. So now I would love to talk about Ida and your entrepreneurship. And this is going to be so much fun. I'm so excited. But I think if you could begin by just outlining the football boot landscape for those who might not know or might not have played football, what does it what does it look like, and especially for women? So up until uh, probably a month ago, uh, you would search for women's football boots, and and all that would come up with was either men's or unisex, and the other than us, obviously. Um, and looking at, at that, there, there was a few, there's been a few forays into trying to do it. But if you, if you walk into a sports store and you look at running, you could have a big choice. So men's, women's, kids, and you really have the opportunity to find stuff that fits you. If you walk into the sports store and look for football, footy boots, soccer cleats, anything like that, it's really, there aren't that many options. So you have men's and you have kids and you think, all right, where's the women's? And it, it just doesn't exist. And it hasn't kept pace perhaps with the growth of the game. And mm. so what you're seeing is that like, I think at the moment there's 35 million registered female players globally and FIFA are trying to double that by 2030. And um, yeah, so it's massive, but you can't buy mm. products for women. So then mm. you're going, well, why is this revolution happened in running, but it hasn't happened in football? And then it yeah. starts to be these kind of structural issues of like, well, women will just put up with it. That's fine. Or it's been traditionally a male sport, even though women have been playing it for like hundreds, of years, you know, hundred over a hundred years, right? And it was yeah. one of the first. And they have very popular crowds, uh, I think, in the interwar years and in the war years, mm. and um, especially in England. So there's yeah. these kind of dynamics at play as well. And, and that's what I was very interested in is like solving that problem of, okay, this is a technical problem functional challenge but it's also an emotional challenge like do we have a right to exist in this space so then what are the key differences between a women's and a men's boot very basically what are the different I know that there's probably plenty and it's pretty obvious for us but what are what are the key differences that you've sort of seen so for women and men um women in general and we talk about feet in general but there, there's obviously a lot of nuances we tend to have narrower heels all the way through the sizes. We tend to have a wider toe box in a different place. So the shape of the foot at the front is slightly different. Um, we tend to have higher arches. They so need a bit more support. And we tend to have, we, we pressure load differently. So this is where the hips and knees and stuff go in. So how our biomechanics um, are different. So that means you need a different outsole and different configuration because how you're interacting with the ground and how you're, making movements and pressing and things like that is um is quite different so all of those together mean that you have to really reconfigure the shoe to 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 benefit as opposed to just well hinder or or kind of put up with it i think one of the things that as a player you'll see um because a lot of women are like what different unisex what and, and have this like light bulb moment mm. often women We'll, we'll talk to them and we'll say, hey, look, well, do you have pain in your little toe? Because that's often a sign because you're squishing your toes in, right? Um, yeah. And the widest point is not the widest point on a woman's foot. Or if you had slippage in your heel or blisters, things like that. Mm. Um, and so those kind of manifestations or pain under the ball of your foot or under the sesamoid, those are quite common experiences from players that we've spoken to. And that's what we try and solve. I would like to touch on, because I saw this quote and it sums it up, I think, quite well, just anything female or anything that's women's. But it's like, have you heard the quote of like the pink it and shrink it? Yeah. <laughs> it, it does sum it up really. Like traditionally, that's what everyone has done. It's just gone, oh, we'll just shrink it. Women are small men and we'll stick pink on it because they love pink. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's you done. Easy, create a brand for women. <laughs> All you need to do, shrink it and pink it. <laughs> 
shrink Easy. it, pink it. But obviously that method for football boots still holds, honestly, quite true. Yeah. Um, and we talked as well just before this about Nike's new sort of shoe, the Phantom Luna, which was I did a little bit of research on it. So it was designed with females in mind um, over apparently a three-year process, but it's unisex, which when we just talk about all of the differences between male and female boots and feet, it sounds like a unisex thing might fit a men's foot a little bit more than a women's because I would assume that if you made a boot for women, a men's foot could not physically fit. Right. So there's definitely a bit of confusion around the shoe and and there's been a lot of reviews from guys who've been wearing it. Um, I mean, I've I've tried it on and it's not the most comfortable shoe. So that would suggest to me that there's perhaps still work to do. But great that they're coming to the party and great that they're actually caring about this stuff because it's... Um, the way to change the industry is to get women's boots everywhere. And then it's, yeah. it's great if you can have some competition. I mean, for us, it's been fantastic because it's led to a spike in sales because people are now learning more and being more aware of the fact that you need, you need products made for you. C is plus it? for effort. Um, <laughs> C plus for effort. <laughs> I'm assuming as well, but it is something that like, I'm sure, I'm not sure I might be putting words into your mouth a little bit here, but like, you don't want to be, the only female football boot, football boot producer in the world, I'm assuming. Like you want there to be more and you want there to be more access for women to find something that is comfortable and that they can wear. A hundred percent. So I, I'm all for the competition. It really increases um, awareness for people and it makes it easier for us to, to work with retailers because they understand then that there's women's shoes. But it's also... Um, I love that competition. We'll just make it better. Um, mm. And that that's part of the fun and the game. It's like being the underdogs, but you can still radically trans. You only really get in innovation and, and transformation, I think, from the outside in these disruptive startups. It's yeah. sometimes hard when you're in the, the paradigm of a big bear moth to just keep doing that. You just keep doing the same thing, right? Because it's worked mm. before and you've made profit before. Yeah. And you really need that shake up to, to change the system and change the industry. So that for me is the exciting part. I didn't come from the shoe industry. So it's meant I, the way I'm approaching the problems is very different and quite innovative to then how traditionalists have done it and brings new thinking, new ideas. And I think that's what you need. You can't, like the women's football game, right? It's, yeah. it's not the men's game. So we no, shouldn't try no. and make it the men's game. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, that's how I approach women's football boots. It's, they're not for men. We, we don't think the same. We're, we're sold to in different ways. We buy things in different ways. I think that for me, it's a really great opportunity to reimagine what it could be like and, and listen to the consumers and, and kind of develop stuff that really works for us. Yeah. Like it's, I want, I want that experience. I want to go and have the same excitement that I had when I went to choose my ballet shoes. And you're like, Oh, it's a special event. Whereas at the moment girls walk into a store and they're like women's football boots or girls football boots. And it's like, yeah, over there, like nothing, like go, go look in the boys section. And, and that's so sad. Like it's, it's really exciting to go and choose your boots for the season and to have that amazing, like, yeah, I feel like I exist in this space. Mm. I like it. I like how you just talked about like, yeah, women, girls go here to get their football boots and like, Oh, where? And I got the pink ones. Yeah. It honestly it is still a bit like that. And, and maybe we'll make pink in the future, but it will be up to the consumers who want it. Right. As opposed to the only thing or, or pastel purple um that's the one that always gets me lilac i would also just like to know what has actually been the reaction to your boots and ida because obviously like we said it's new it's there's nothing out there like it is it pretty much just everyone having a light bulb moment being like oh my gosh that makes like your eyes are just opened to a whole new world Honestly, it, that's pretty much it. Like people we speak to and then they go, what? Women's boots? What have I been doing all my life? I had a fascinating chat with the Sky Sports presenter who she'd, she'd played for like 20 odd years and she tried on our shoes and she was like, oh, 
this is what my shoes should have felt like. And, and she couldn't speak for a minute because she was just like, oh, and you have this like, oh, what's, what's been happening all my life? Um, and I think if we're able to like create that, that moment and that experience for people, that, that's what I wanted. I just wanted to forget about my shoes, right? I didn't want to have to come off the pitch and be like, oh, they're so painful. Um, I wanted to step onto the pitch and forget about it and just play and then walk off and be you know like not have like aching bits we aching from running that's fine but not from <laughs> like foot pain and yeah. and and then and then we can go and solve another problem because this is a problem like it should have been solved a long time ago mm. no it was funny I was talking about um like this podcast with someone she's actually an expert Tilda and I was just talking about it and I was like oh I'm doing this podcast like who have you got on and I was like I've got Laura she creates female football boots and she's like what and I was like yeah she makes female football boots and she was like if I had them when I played, my right? feet would have been saved. And this is part of the problem that I think we chat to a lot of players and, and it, it's not necessarily also when you're playing, it's then all the after stuff. And like, do you want longevity and being active for your entire life? Um, mm. Which I think is incredibly important. And I mean, people are having this discussion about concussions at the moment and like the impact it has. Yeah. I think your biomechanics as well. Like, we, yes, you you want to have this incredible career, but you want to be able to walk when you're forty. So, I would also just like we're going to talk a little bit more about entrepreneurship now. But just quickly, why did you? Why the sports industry for founding for Ida? What what was the reason? Was it just because it was a massive passion of yours, and it's an industry that? Well, you played sport your entire life and you surrounded yourself with it and that was sort of just a natural progression or yeah a little bit about that yeah I think I mean it, it's I feel very at home in the sports industry it's something I understand I work for the Olympics um you can see what sport and diplomacy can do sport can often change things in a way that you can't change elsewhere I think I think you can get through a lot of sneaky social change like you look at what's happened with the Euros and with the World Cup and the makeup of the the audience last night at the USA Sweden game was um, men, families. You know, like you, you're you're really transforming the society through it. But for me, it's more about the the problem to solve. So before this, I set up a non-alcoholic gin company um, because there's a gap to solve and a problem to solve around providing non-alcoholic beverages. I I since I'm a serial entrepreneur and I'm completely unemployable um so being able to work on really meaty cool problems and change industries is what drives me uh perhaps more 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 so even in the industry but sport is always fun to to hang out in it's good we talk about it obviously because we work in the sports industry we talk about it being so unique in how it makes people feel and and how it can bring people from honestly all different sides of the world together for one common thing and one common goal and there's not much else in the world that really achieves that as well which I think is what makes yeah sports such a special place and a special place to be and to work in um so you're also incredibly passionate about women specifically in entrepreneurship and business so why is this and it's going to be can't wait for this, but why is it important to you and why should we see more women in these roles? I know it's a topic that a lot of people have covered, but for you specifically, why is it really important for more women mm. to be entrepreneurs and in business and really leading the charge in that area? I think being able to solve problems for women or, or, or whatever group you're from, right? Um, hmm. The default is like uh, Invisible Women, right? And that book and it like car crash dummies and airplane seats and everything, right? That It's made mm. off a default size. I think if you have diverse voices and diverse thoughts, then you're, you're building the products that people want or, and services that are for those communities and solving those problems. And mm. you don't have to be from those communities, but it, it really helps because you've had that lived experience and no one can argue with that. Like I wore kids' shoes to play football. It was painful. Mm. Like, that is why I'm solving the problem. I cannot retire until I've made the perfect shoe for me. Um, you know, this is this is kind of the what, what drives it. But 
the more you can get people solving these problems, I think the better um, it is overall for everyone. So I met uh, the guys from Soul Cap recently, and they make swimwear, swim swim caps, and other swimwear for for um, black and ethnic minority hair. Yeah. And this is just, and then they've changed the like FINA regulations, or in the process of changing FINA regulations, right, to make it better for people to compete. So then you're you're wow. increasing participation and you're increasing increasing inclusivity and but doing it through product, right? Um yeah. and encouraging that. And for me that's exactly the same driver of like how do you get in? But the biggest problem is it's funding. Yeah. So like less than two percent of VC funding goes to women. And that's gone down from four percent. So it's actually got worse uh, in the last few years. And so Imagine what it'd be like if you actually did fund women because we make these incredibly profitable businesses. Um, mm. and, and instead of wasting your time trying to raise investment, I, you could spend your time designing even cooler things and solving other problems, right? So then just leading from that, how can we enable more women to enter into the sports business space or just in entrepreneurship and, and that area? How can we support them? How can we enable, how can we enable more women to join in? Chuck money at them. No, uh, I mean, that would be the one way to do it because there's no shortage of women with ideas that I come across. Yeah. I, I, so flippantly, but yes, investing in women, but also just get started. And one of the, the best things I love is, I mean, I now know there's at least 12 female-led um, businesses in the sports tech space just solving these kind of, they didn't design for us mentality and let's let's go and solve it ourselves. And you can start very cheaply by um, doing a proof of concept and going, hey, yeah, I've made something and do people want it and will they buy it? And then being able to grow from there. I think then as you scale, having those support networks around to be able to help navigate those systems is really important. And I, I connect with lots of women before it was probably me and like seven guys on a on a zoom call and that's my standard week and now mm. it's really changed and and there's a lot more women involved and and we share and connect with each other and help improve the businesses because if one succeeds and everyone succeeds and and you really start to then see a shift and a transformational shift um which is incredible but just get started and and you can figure most things out along the way that's the best thing <laughs> It's a secret to success, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Don't don't just leave it as an idea. Have a go, and and if you fail, fine. But you'll have learned loads of stuff. Yeah, that you can take on to whatever you do next. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, final question, which I've asked everyone um, across the across the series, just a bit of a wrap up. But the question is, where do you see women's football in five years, in ten years, and well into the future? Where do you see it going? Do you have any idea where it could go? A lot of people have been like, I have no idea where it could go, but I'm excited oh, to see so the journey. many ideas. I think one of the exciting parts for me is the fact that everyone can play. So at the moment we see quite an elite pyramid and, that, and that's great. And the product at the top level is getting better. And you've got the WSL, fantastic, and the NWSL, really interesting leagues. Um, I think where it's in like becomes more fascinating is what I'm seeing. Like in San Diego, they've got a really amazing community of women over 40 mm. up till I think their oldest player is like 87 um, playing regularly. And so then you go, ah, being active throughout your entire life and having competitive leagues, fascinating. And then you look at, for example, the different formats of the game. So I think actually 90 minutes, is not going to stay as 90 minutes of football. I think there's going to be some changes so that you're having um, different, like you've got futsal, which is a really fascinating sport, lots of goals. Mm. You've got like indoor, you've got, you know, all these variations of the game. So you've got both the, the game as a product and an entertainment and I think products that will have more goals um, mm. and more kind of crazy saves and things like that. And then you've got football as a, a lifestyle and a part of your cardio, like instead of going to the gym or whatever, you've got your community. So yeah. for me, that's the the really fascinating growth opportunity. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. 
Well, that is honestly, that's everything. Thank you so much for coming on, Laura. It has been, uh, it's been awesome. I've enjoyed, honestly, I've enjoyed every second. So thank you for taking the time. I know it's very busy for you with all of your World Cup adventures that you've got going on. And I know you've been here, there and everywhere. So uh, no, thank you for taking the time and thanks for coming on. Cheers, Kate. Yeah, enjoy it. <laughs>